Start. Start. So today we're going to do some auto-electrical um, teaching, okay? Auto-electrical, this will be a foundational um, unit to help you to mm -hmm. understand electrical components in the car, okay? Yes. It will be a reasonably basic course, get it, get it. but it's a foundation that you need to know. Everyone needs to know this, and I want everyone to be here for this. I don't want anyone coming in after I do and start this today because I'll get behind if they do. So we've got four days for this course. We'll be doing three days in class and next and next Thursday, next Friday, not this Friday, but next Friday we'll be at the workshop. So this week in class for the next yeah. two two days, okay? In class for next, next Thursday, the workshop in a fortnight's time. Hello? Good morning, Amen. You've been, you've been AWOL for a while, haven't you? Yeah. I'm glad you're back. All right. <laughs> now, yeah. so testing and repairing basic electrical circuits is the course we're doing, or the unit we're doing. So like always, we talk a little bit again about our safety factor. We have to be more conscious with our critical um, work. We've got um, jewellery that can actually um, be a conductor. A conductor means it will conduct electrons to move through whatever the metal is into our body and we can burn ourselves because they get hot. Um, whenever we have resistance in something, you'll learn generates heat. And there'll be resistance in this watch or in my jewellery that I've got hanging off for me if I had any. And that produces heat, and that's quite uh, a risk when we're doing anything on a car that's electrical. Um, we also have to realise some of our um, diagnostic equipment. We're talking about a, a multimeter. A multimeter has a lot of different, different um, tasks that we need to understand how to use a multimeter. We need to have some skills to understand how to use that to be efficient. We have an oscilloscope. We have uh, battery testers, we have had some experience with that. But all those things take some skill that we may or may not have and we have to know. So in this course we'll fine tune some of those skills hopefully, okay? Did everyone get one of these tap books? Please get one if you haven't. Yeah, have you all got one of these books? Come and get some after, they're up the front here, okay? Now, <laughs> who knows when we're soldering? Okay, so other it's got lead in it. And when we're melting that lead, the lead fumes can be breathed into us if we're not careful. So we need to be in a ventilated area for soldering because we don't want to get lead poisoning milk. Okay, and what else? Um, we re yeah, I think we require to use the right tools um, to do get the right job done. All right. I want you to watch this little video for me, okay? Jeff's me. Some of you have already met Jeff, I think, at uh, AutoCAD. Um, Jeff Smith did a seminar, or a webinar, as you call it, a webinar on basic electrics, okay? So some of what he said is very relevant for our unit. So there's a couple of times where he will be sharing on video. So I'll play this one now. Please listen and be quiet. Welcome to tonight's uh, TAP webinar. Uh, which is on electrical electronic fundamentals and principles. Uh, my name is Jeff Smith and I'm your presenter here this evening. So let's get started with electric shock. Electricity. Obviously we know it can be dangerous and when we're dealing with a higher voltage and if you've ever taken a module out of a HID uh, headlamp or you're looking at injectors and stuff, there can be quite often a warning. So question first up for you guys. What voltage do you think would cause death? So again, just think about it yourself. At what voltage would you be, not be prepared to put your hands over that voltage? We've all touched a 12 volt battery or a 24 volt battery across the terminals. Uh, but at what point are you gonna say, well, no, I'm not gonna do that. It's possibly gonna cause me some harm. And the second question there, how much current will it take to kill somebody? So again, how much current do you think? How many amps do you need to have across your body uh, to think that it's gonna do you some real serious harm or potentially death? But again, what we're looking at voltage-wise is not as important, okay? It's the current that will kill you. But to get current flow across your body, your body is a resistor, and we'll, we'll touch on that later. The, the, the average uh, resistance of a human body is about 100K, so 100,000 ohms. So we need a certain amount of voltage to be able to pierce through that resistance 
to allow the current to flow. So we need the voltage, yes, but it's actually the current that will kill you. So in a current situation, if it goes across your heart, you probably only need seven milliamps. So 0.007 of an amp to actually do you some serious damage, more than likely gonna kill you. Again, if it's just across another part of your body and not crossing your heart, then they're saying about 100 milliamps, so 0.1 of an amp. So if you consider the human body 100,000 uh, ohms, if we had 12 volts, we're talking 0.00012 of an amp or something would be going across your body. What we have to remember is when we put our fingers across a 12 volt battery, we are actually closing that circuit. We are a resistor, 100,000 ohms, 1K ohm. Uh, so therefore current will flow. We have current going across our body at that point. It is so small, it's not gonna make any difference to us. If you wanna check it, get an amp meter and do it yourself, but over a 12 volt battery, don't go any you know, too much higher. But it will be a small current flow there. The problem is the brain is sending an electrical sig signal to our heart, boom, 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 boom to pump. That current is not gonna interfere with that signal. The, the heart will keep going. It's at, at a point when we get to a high enough voltage and current that we will then interfere with that, that signal and therefore uh, interfere with the heartbeat, the, the, heart, the, beat, the beat of your heart. So again, that's when it can really uh, uh, cause you some injury. Uh, if someone else has got a, a, an electric shock and is in a position, uh, don't touch. Obviously look, observe, learn from the situation. Make sure you don't become part of the problem by going in too quickly when there could still be electrical uh, shock uh, potential there, even for the people that are uh, uh, going in to help. Try and switch off any electrical mains, remove fuses, turn off power points, unplug all cords approaching the person, etc. This would apply to any electrical shop, be it electric car or uh, hybrids or you know power points, etc. If that's not possible, use a, a, a product or something like a broom handle, something that is not a, a conductor, so an insulator, uh, where you can move the electrical source away from the person or make it uh, uh, safe for you to get involved. And again, if there's a downed power line, try and remain well and truly clear. Now, if it's a downed power line, we could be talking any sort of voltage, very, very high current, so it can arc across air, you know? So if there's an air gap there, it could arc across if you especially get too close to it. So again, very, be very, very, be very, very careful. Whenever safe, obviously try and get to the, get to the patient, uh, make sure that you see if they're breathing and, and conscious. Uh, if no response, start, start CPR. If there are electrical burns, you know, clean cold water, uh, just cut, cut running water, uh, keep it sterile. Don't put blankets or anything on it because there's fibers and things that can stick to them. So just, just use common sense and it's those first aid is probably the best thing to, 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 to undertake if you want to do that. I hope that sunk in a little bit. The um, fact that a battery will not give you enough current to kill you is, you know, a 12 volt battery. But we are now dealing with cars that have much higher voltage and, and a lot more current flow than we've ever had before. Got capacitors that store up power and discharge. And so we do have to be careful around some of the electrical things that we are handling, particularly when it comes to electric cars. We've got high voltage electric cars now, like. 280 volts or something, that's going to kill us. So we need to be aware of those things. And we need to be aware of what we do if we do get an electric shock. Someone in our workshop has an electric shock. If it, as the Jeff Smith said, if some high voltage is on you, you're not going to go as a rescuer and touch that body until you get a broomstick or something that's non-conductive to, to remove that source of um, danger, okay? So that's important. So just keep all that in mind. All right, we'll move on. Um, so um, we need electricity, don't we, to have these lights on, we have electricity in our house for all sorts of things that we use. And we heard Jeff talk about the heart needing electricity from the brain. It's quite intriguing to think our bodies have all this electricity running through it and that our brain sends all these signals through electric circuits. And, uh, you know, we can't see the electricity, can we? No, but we know it's there because we can feel it, can't we? Yes, we don't want to feel it, but we can. Sometimes we can hear it if it's arcing, can't we? Um, we can smell it if it's burnt. So, you know, there, there's the presence of electricity, but we can't see it. We can't see it. All right. Um, I want to just make something very clear. As a mechanic, we know what we're fixing. We see a ball joint that's got play in it and we know we're going to replace a ball joint. 
or we see a um, oil leak and we know where the oil leak's coming from. It really doesn't take too long to see something that's not quite right if it's a mechanical problem, does it? You know? But it's a different story when it comes to um, looking at electrical problems. Often it takes much longer to find what's causing the electrical problem than actually fixing it. The fixing is all, always an e or usually an easy fix, generally solving a wire, cleaning a terminal, tightening a bolt, whatever it is. But with um, you know, electrical, when we're mechanically minded, we think in terms of um, when the customer comes in, I've got a problem with my car, no worries, I'll get back with a quote and we'll ring them up within 10 minutes and say you need a new ball joint. But when they come in with an electrical problem, can we do that? No. no. We can't. So we need to be able to educate the customer that, all right, we can look at your problem, but we're going to have to spend some money so we can find your problem, you know? And we need to communicate that to our customers. And to be aware ourselves that, yeah, we do need time. A lot of places, a lot of bosses are not really good at um, um, understanding if they're not a mechanic themselves or an auto technician themselves. They're not very good at understanding sometimes, and we have to even educate our bosses sometimes. Yeah. Guys, if you want to do a job properly, the time we spend at the beginning of this job is going to save time in the long run if we put the right time into fixing something. If we go is just changing a um, component in an electrical circuit because it's not working, it might not be that component. It's very likely not that component. It's very likely a wiring problem or a another sort of circuit problem, okay? So we need to keep that in mind. Diagnostic and repair. So again, what we've moved into from what was traditionally a mechanical trade into more of an electrical uh, uh, environment, we have to learn what the difference is now with our industry. So diagnosis and repair. A couple of things I just wanted to quickly point out when we're talking about electrical repairs. Don't be afraid to do it right, okay? Take your time. Make sure you've done your work and you, and you do it as right. Electrical repairs are far less forgiving if you do the wrong thing. Uh, you know, the wrong probe somewhere else, power or earth where it shouldn't be, uh, you can make some, some, some big and expensive mistakes very, very quickly. Working on the electronic, electrical side of a motor vehicle requires you to be precise, patient and precise. So you need to be very careful of what you're doing, understand why you're doing it, understand the circuit you're working on, which we're gonna to touch on a bit tonight today in regards to that uh, you know, wiring diagrams and understanding circuits. Electrical repairs are very different, almost completely different to mechanical repairs. So mechanical repairs quite often uh, would be uh, fast to diagnose, but then a fairly big job to repair. So uh, you would quickly work out that the brakes are worn out or it's got a rattle in the engine or whatever the mechanical problem is, and then you would quote for the repair of those parts. So the years gone by, the old school way, was diagnosed for free, fixed for a fee. And that unfortunately has become a real trait within the industry where not only us in the industry, but our consumers, our customers, expect us to be able to diagnose things for free and then give them a quote and then they can decide whether they want to go ahead with it. When it comes to the electrical side of it, obviously totally, un you can't do that anymore. Slow down and think. Don't guess, don't assume. Just because the customer says, oh, that's been checked, go and check it yourself again, okay? Start with the basics. Don't assume that someone has already done something. Don't assume the battery's okay. Don't assume the chassis is okay. Don't assume anything. Go and check it. Get into a habit of making sure you check the basics first. I always find a good thing is to work out what is working. Okay, if it, if it is working, we can tick that off. And then we can hone down to find out well, okay, what's not working and why may that not be working. If this is working and that's working and this isn't, well, then we can hone it down to a certain maybe part of the car that's not behaving itself. Diagrams, again, if you're not comfortable with diagrams, uh, we're going to cover that later on in this particular webinar, but we've got to make sure we locate the load. So whatever it is that is not working, that component, that's the load, that's the resistance in the circuit. We need to locate that first. That's our problem. Reading, reading diagrams from the loads, okay? Circuits are defined by the load, not by the fuses. So again, find the load. Nearly all circuits work in the same way, and again, we'll cover that in, in, in shortly. Uh, the majority of faults can be in wires and connections. So again, don't discount that there can be issues with wiring and connections, not just components, etc. Again, one of my, uh, my, my 
uh, very uh, common phrases I use is slow down to speed up. Okay, so if you slow down and think about what you're doing first, you'll get to the finish a lot quicker rather than just rushing at it and guessing. So again, just slow down to speed up. Something I've like sometimes uh, learned to do as well. So I missed some of that. I have said it before, but I um, feel that Jeff, what he said at the end about slowing down was a very key thing when we're doing electrical. We need to be conscious of what we are looking into. We need to understand what we're looking at. We need to understand how it works. With a mechanical thing, most of us would understand how a ball joint turns and moves and whatnot. But with electrical, there's different types of circuits in cars. There's different types of um, loads. What a load is, is what the um, energy or the current does. The current will load up something to make it work. For example, a wiper motor is a load. A, even a light bulb is a load. We need a load in every circuit, okay? Otherwise, we don't have resistance in the circuit and we end up with the, what's called a short circuit, which will then flatten the battery and cause a fire uh, or blow a fuse, hopefully. So a load, um, you know, is something that we have to understand. How is it um, operated? How is it controlled? Um, what voltage goes to that load? Is it a drop voltage? Some um, sensors, for example, only have five volt reference voltages going to them. So we have to understand the circuit and how it works and how that's what we expect from that circuit, okay? All right. Um, what's the most important thing to check on any electrical job, do you think? Sorry? The most important thing to look at first, if something electrically is not working. Battery. Battery, battery, yeah. Battery's the source of where everything starts from, doesn't it? Yeah. So always make sure we've got a good battery, okay? Very important, all right? Who knows there's only, who knows there's only four reasons we can have an electrical fault? If I told you there's only four reasons, would that make it simple? Yes. It would? Okay. It's simple in one sense, I guess we're only looking for four things, okay? Not so simple because we have to find out what's caused one of those four things. That's where the complication or the, the time consuming part of the job comes from. Four things are, we can have an open circuit, okay? It's just not closing. Who knows what an open and closed circuit is? No one? But there's no flow of current. No flow, no flow of, of current. current. We have to have it switched on, okay? When it's switched on, where current can flow, then it's a closed circuit. We'll see that in a minute, we'll go over that again. We can have an open circuit. We can have what's called a short circuit. A short circuit to ground, okay? Or we can have a short circuit to power, where something's powering up and the switch doesn't turn it on or off, it stays on all the time. Or we can have high resistance in the circuit. So four things, that's all. So we'll cover that, but that's just something to keep in mind. Those four things I want you to memorize and realize and keep it in your mind so that you know when you are working electrical things, you know you're only looking for one of those four things. And it's very easy to work out which of those four things very quickly when you either have a blown fuse, which would indicate you've got a short circuit, you would have no power going to the load, which means that you've got an open circuit, you'd have a dull light, for example, which means you've got resistance, um, and you would have it when you say the light was staying on and your interior light was staying on all the time, you would, and no matter what you did, you couldn't turn it off, you've probably got a um, power to short, sorry, a short to power, okay? We'll talk about that more soon. I think the first thing we have to understand is how electricity works, okay? Electricity works through the movement of what we call electrons, okay? We have what's called atoms. Atoms, okay, inside to build up an atom, okay, we have in the centre, we have a proton. And that proton is what's a positive charge of that atom, okay? It's a positive charge. Then we have some neutrons that float around. The neutrons are no charge, okay? They're nothing. Then we have electrons. And it's electrons that are negatively charged, okay? Who knows which way the um, electrons flow in a circuit? Do they flow from negative to positive? Who can tell me? Am I right? Do they fall, fall, do they go, or do they go from positive to negative? Positive to negative. They, who said positive to negative? Anyone? 
Positive to negative? Who says negative to positive? Oh, we got a smart person in the class. Okay. Our theory in the old days, when they were discovering, discovering electricity, was that electrons flowed from positive to negative. That's called... Um, Oh, there's a name for it, it'll be on the slide. Um, conventional. That's called conventional current flow. But that is wrong. We've now learned that always electrons flow from the negative back to the positive, okay? So when we have an atom, right, when we put voltage through a conductor, that will, that's, and the conductor is something that will allow electrons to move, okay? This table is not a conductor, it's an insulator. Wood or lamination or fabrics are a, a, not a good conductor, okay? But um, certainly um, copper wire is a good, and we use that in our wiring, is a good conductor. The electrons, when it's getting voltage from the, and the battery, remember the battery is an imbalance of electrons. So we've got positive charged electrons on this side, of the of the battery and on the other side we have negative charge we have a, an excess of both and what's happening is we're pushing the the electrons wanting to get back from the negative to the positive that's what's happening and what it does is each atom will have a floating negative electron and when it gets voltage in it it's going to go back to the positive terminal and it's going to run from one atom to the next to the next and we have a pattern of it here. See how the negative? The negative is going to the positive charge, then to the next one, then to the next one, until it gets back to the positive battery. And that's how the electronic uh, ele electrons flow in a conductor. It flows from one atom to the next by releasing, by releasing one negative electron to the next atom, and then from that one to the next one until it gets back. Eventually the battery will run flat if we don't keep it charged. Eventually, because all the electrons will balance out eventually. So the battery has a potential difference between the negative and the positive of electrons. The voltage, okay, the voltage is not the voltage is not what's moving. Okay? Voltage does not move. What moves? Current. Current moves. Okay, the movement of those electrons is what's moving. The voltage is a pressure for the electrons to move, okay? Very important to know that. Current flow is very important to know, and we'll learn more about that. All right. Okay, electrons have a negative charge. Yes, we've covered all that, but that's just a picture again of the electrons flowing to the positive. It doesn't get much simpler than this. A little 1.5 volt battery, uh, torch battery, torch bulb, and two copper wires and we can just touch these terminals together between the case of the battery and the torch battery and the battery and then the negative to the ter terminal in the center of the bulb and we can see it light up and uh, this is what we call current flow current flows which generates the energy that's needed for that light bulb to light up as the energy flows through from the passing of the electrons it all goes through that filament that filament is a resistance and it's such a resistance that it will actually heat up to a point where it will burn and cause it to light up it's really a, a, the heat that causes that bulb to light up and it, it will go back to the source through the battery and eventually it will drain that battery down as all the electrons from the negative uh, well actually the electrons flow um, from um, the negative to the positive contrary to what most wiring diagrams and what we used to say and think but yes this is how a simple parallel circuit and we'll talk about parallel circuits later will work and and this is a very simple simple thing and so is most of the automotive electronic um, and electric um, circuits are all broken down to a similar pattern that we're seeing here so I just said everything is simple. If you ever looked at a wiring diagram, does it <laughs> perplex you to see all these wires going everywhere? Yeah. It does, but when we get to understand the wiring diagram, we can break it up into all these little tiny circuits like that torch bulb, okay? They become simple when we do that. And I often use highlighters. I write markers and I have 
green for the ground circuit, I have a red for the positive circuit, and I generally lay it out where I've highlighted the circuit I'm only interested in, and it takes my eyes away from everything else and just concentrates on what I want to look at and how, I, how the thing works. So we'll look at that probably next week, how we can look at wiring diagrams. But for now, I just want you to understand, don't get perplexed when you see a wiring diagram. Eventually, you'll be able to work it out. Hopefully, by the end of this class, you'll have a better idea of how to do that. I also said that, um, hang on. I forgot what I was going to say there. Don't worry about me. Okay. Flow of electricity. To have the continuous flow of electricity, it must be an excess of electrons from one place, okay, to the other. Hey? Must have a lack of electrons <coughs> in the other place. So we must always have more electrons in the, in the negative than the positive to have that balance to, to balance out, okay? And we must, it's very important, we must have a path between the two. If we don't have a closed circuit, if it's an open circuit, electrons cannot flow, okay? You'll hear me as we go on talk about you know, doing our voltage drop test, and we've already talked a little bit about that in alternators, but we can't do a voltage drop test if we don't have current flowing. It's useless, okay? Also, when current doesn't flow, and we'll learn a bit more later, but it gives us some advantages um, when we're testing different circuits, because if we don't have a complete circuit, we will have voltage at the other side of the resistor where it doesn't go to ground, if it's a ground control circuit, for example, if the circuit is open. And that can tell us that we've got a good wiring because there's um, voltage at the opposite side going back to the ground side. And I might be losing you on that, but when we do some of the hands-on stuff later on, we'll get the feel of that, okay? All right. Uh, I'm just being silly. <laughs> Volt swiping. Yeah. <laughs> oh, All right. Okay. Our cars use the power source from the battery to you know start the car. We know that. The uses which is used by chemical reaction from the battery. Okay, that provides um, current. And also, once the car starts, the alternator takes over, doesn't it? The alternator is creating an AC voltage, which then is converted to a DC voltage to be useful, but uh, we've got, got to remember, not only do we have to have a good battery, but we also have to have a good alternator, okay? We need to be checking if our battery is getting low, have we got good charge rate, okay? Very important, because that alternator is really what does um, all the work once the car starts running for electrical circuits, all right? So, some of the terms we use, so we want to get used to these terms. We've already talked a lot about current flow, haven't we? Yeah. How do we measure current flow? Amps. Amps. So we measure it in the ampers, which is measured in amps, okay? So we can tell how much current's flowing by how much, much amps it's reading on the amp meter. Again, voltage is electrical pressure. It's a force, okay? We think of voltage as a force. Okay, we also think of voltage as a potential difference between two points. Okay, and we take a reading in volts, so we read voltage by reading volts. And resistance, how do we read resistance? Ohms. In ohms, we use an ohm meter, don't we? So, do we have resistance in a straight copper wire? Is there any resistance in a copper wire? Yes, no. Yes, yes. There is. Yes. Very little, but there is. And yes, we'll short circuit the battery if we turn the two terminals together with nothing in the middle. But every circuit, as I said before, needs some sort of resistance. Otherwise, we will short circuit and flatten the battery if we don't have resistance, okay? We will still flatten the battery over time with resistance, but it will take a longer time because of the resistance. And we don't heat up so much. The resistance, there will be heat from the resistance, uh, all resistance causes heat, okay? But uh, the lower the resistance, um, the less the heat, okay? So it's getting hot in here. I turned the aircon up. Before. Maybe somebody put it down. Put it down? I guarantee <laughs> other, parts, <laughs> other parts get hotter than others. Excuse me. Tell you what. Break. Yeah, just wait a minute. We'll, we'll just keep going. I'll turn it up later. Sorry. Okay. 
Do you take a little bit of break? So again, we have covered all this, haven't we? Yes. yes. Um, what I haven't mentioned is sometimes electronic movement, which causes um, okay, causes a magnetic or causes a um, how would you say like um, a EMF, an electro move. Electromotive force, force, okay? Electromotive force, I should say. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Isaac. So, that's another term we use. Again, think of knowledge as forcing electrons to move, okay? Just think of that. What's that, Isaac? No matter where I put Isaac, he talks to people, doesn't he? He likes to talk. He's a joke. I think I'll get him up here. I think I'll get him up here and then the uh, rest of the job. Uh, he can share the job. Stop. Don't joke him. Don't joke him. Don't joke him. Let's talk about resistance again, okay? Okay. When a substance flows, it meets resistance, okay? That's the same with our garden hose. If we put a nozzle on a garden hose, we can screw that nozzle down to cause a resistance so the water doesn't flow as much, okay? Or we can open it up and it flows a lot. Well, it's no different to electricity. If we don't have any resistance in the copper wire, it's going to flow very quickly. If we put a resistance in the wire, like our garden hose, we can slow it down, okay? So if we slow down the flow of current, okay, we don't overheat the system and we and we aim, we're able to control the load that we're loading up, okay? And every load is a resistance, okay? What's a load? Who can tell me what a load is? Sorry? What's a load? Maybe I'll show you a load. That would be the motor. That's a load. That, that there, that motor is a load. Okay? It's an electric device that we want the energy from the current flow to activate and, and make that motor work. But it's also a resistance. So that is safe to put into an electric circuit because it will resist the flow of electrons and it will slow down the flow, okay? And when it slows down the flow, okay, it doesn't short circuit, does it? Sorry? So what happens is, the voltage will come in at 12 volts. It will have a big voltage drop. And on the other side, where it goes to ground, it will go to zero volts. Because the load, this is resisting the load. Okay, and the load will be activated because of the current flowing through there. And the load will return back to the ground at a, at a much lower voltage, okay? Nearly zero volts. We'll learn about that, okay? Um, so, again, resist, resistance produces heat. Loads are, are good resistances. Too low or too high resistance can also cause a fault, okay? So we have manufacturer's resistance in what we're driving, okay? Whatever that um, circuit we're driving, the manufacturer's worked out how much um, current needs to flow and they've worked it all out and it comes back to the battery, okay, to the positive side of the battery. But what happens is, if the terminal becomes loose, if the wire becomes corroded, we get resistance elsewhere in the circuit, we've got extra resistance in that circuit, so we have an extra voltage drop. The higher the resistance, the more voltage drop, okay? And we don't want voltage drop in a circuit, otherwise it won't work correctly. And that can be one of our faults, one of our four faults if we have too much resistance, okay? Some resistance is good, too much is not good, all right? Too little is not good either. If we have a short to ground, it's not good. Okay, um, DC current flow. It flows in what direction? Which direction is DC current flow? One direction, but which way? Sorry? Which way is it flowing? Perfect, yeah, you've got it. Okay. AC current, it's a bit different, isn't it? AC current is fluctuating between uh, positive to negative. Let's throw my books around again. George. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
So uh, you guys are slayed, that's what you're doing. <laughs> okay, is it? How am I going to sleep? All right. Um, who's going to sleep? Everyone. Everyone. Who's bored? Everyone. Yes. All right. We've got to get through this. As soon as we get through this, we get some better stuff. Okay. Um, so AC current is is equally going up and down, up and down. It's AC, it's alternating, okay? But with the, with the automotive, we need to be direct current in a straight line, okay? But we do use AC current in automotive. We have a alternator that charges in AC, well not charges, but outputs in AC, but then it's rectified to DC. We also have some sensors that work in AC. We've seen that on some of our sensors going up and down, okay? So we do use AC as well. All right, here's a simple closed circuit. We saw that before on a light bulb that we had before, okay? But here, now we've got some um, re references. We've got 12 volts going in, and it's a resistance of 6 ohms. Now, I haven't taught you ohms law yet, but if I knew ohms law, I could tell you how many amps are flying through that light bulb. I'm just seeing how smart we are though. Is anyone, can anyone tell me how many amps are flying through? Two. Who said that? Come up here. Come up. Up. Come. Come. Don't yeah, be embarrassed. Yeah. Come. Oh, come. 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 Stand up. Stand up. Come here. Come here. Come here. I need you. Don't be embarrassed. I need you, baby. I need you. I need you, baby. <laughs> Out of all my class, come here. I didn't think you would tell me the answer. Give me five. That's cool. <laughs> How did you know that? It's my favorite number. Sorry? <laughs> you know I'm so. <laughs> you know all this. Why am I teaching you? Come up and teach. No, good on you. That was good. <laughs> so what... Um, break. Break. I love that. What yeah. Jerry did... He divided, he divided 6 into 12, which is 2 amps. And that's how Ohm's law works out, okay? And we'll get the feel of that later. So, yeah. Did anyone else know the answer? You're the only one, Jerry. You're about to Yeah, yeah. Probably have a All right. Let's have a look at some basic electric basics, volts, resistance, and current. So let's have a look at what they are, how, they, how they're displayed when we're looking at them, and, and where they might come from. So voltage is electri electrical pressure. Uh, again, expressed as a V, voltage. So it can be a DC volt, just like we have on that particular signal. And this might appear on our multimeters, etc. cetera. Uh, it also can be AC, so VAC or a capital V with the swirly light on it. So it, that's AC voltage. Something you should use the AC voltage when you're checking for ripple voltage, for instance, on an automotor or a car. While the car's charging, quickly flick it over to ripple voltage, you can then check what that ripple voltage is using the AC uh, part of your multimeter. Millivolts and others, again, we can look at millivolts, millivolts AC, etc. Potential and potential difference. Okay, potential difference is voltage, uh, and it's needed to make electrons flow from one position to another. So the voltage is the, is the potential difference or the power that's gonna make the actual electrons move. We need that to get that, that, that flowing. Common sources of voltage or potential difference, batteries obviously of all kinds, be it lead acid, uh, glass mat, calcium, you know, whatever the thing is, if it's got to be used, even our little alkaline batteries, etc. they're all sources of, of voltage. Alternators and generators, obviously they generate or alternate, uh, generate a voltage. Sunlight, solar cells, solar cells can do that. Uh, pressure, bedroom, pressure transducer. So there's different ways that we can generate voltage uh, from different sources. But from us, motor vehicle wise, obviously your battery and your automotor are our main two sources of a voltage, which is what we need to get circuits working. So on the, the first one there, we've got a potential difference there of 12 volts. We're basically just measuring across the battery. Post to post, we can see what the battery voltage is. Now, if you've got a healthy battery, it might be 12.6. If you've got a pretty crook battery, it might be 11.8 or whatever it might be. But that initial voltage is gonna give you some guidance. 
We then can move over to the switch. You can see that the switch hasn't got a figure there at the moment. So I want you to think about this and think out what is that figure in it and fill out the middle of the screen, the yellow screen, and then we can do the sums at the bottom. So again, we can have a look at that. Let's look at the load on the uh, on that right hand side. Again, zero potential difference. So we're measuring on one side of the load and if we track along, there's no voltage getting to there, so it's gonna be zero. And the other side, zero. So zero minus zero, zero potential difference across the load. We have no current flow, no electron flow, nothing's happening because the switch is open. So if you think about the switch on the red side, on the battery side of the load, what voltage or potential voltage do we have there? We've got the battery voltage, 12 volts. On the other side, because we have a circuit all the way through the ground, through the load, we've got a zero potential there as well. So again, in that particular case, we've got 12 volts on one side, zero on the other, 12 volts. We've got to remember when we're using our multimeters and we've got our two probes, what we're actually reading there, or our multimeter is reading, is the potential difference in volts from those two probes, from where we're putting the probes. So depending on where we put them, we'll cover that when it comes to the you know, uh, uh, voltage drop. It depends where we put those probes to what the gauge is going to tell us, our multimeter. So it's going to give us what the potential difference is between those two probes in a voltage, positive or negative. Something we have to really remember when we're using a voltmeter or a, our digital multimeters, that we are just measuring the difference of potential voltage between those two points. See that voltage? You see voltage there? Yes. That's ghost voltage. It's reading millivolts, like 273 millivolts. But is it real? No. It's not real, is it? I want to show you something. If I make a closed circuit with my multimeter, what am I going to see? Will I see ghost voltage? Zero. Close voltage. Zero 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 zero. Zero zero? Zero zero zero. Okay, just just imagine just imagine I'm checking a circuit, right? I'm going from one point to the other, maybe a ground, and I'm and I'm looking for a voltage, but I get goes voltage. What's that telling me? What's that telling me? <laughs> telling me I've got an open circuit. Because I've got an open circuit. Does that make sense? Yes. So ghost voltage can work to our, our advantage, okay? Because if we're looking at a circuit that's got ghost voltage, it's not connected to ground or wherever we're connected to, okay? Yeah, we can use an ohm meter, but sometimes to use an ohm meter, we've got to disconnect two ends and go to both ends. Yep. This way we only go to one end and we can see straight away. Sometimes some of the things he said to us, which I even got wrong, but when I realised that I don't know why, but I want to make sure you understand. Okay, we've got our 12 volt battery. The 12 volt battery, right? We've got our fuse. Okay, we've got our switch. And we have our resistor, which can be any sort of a load. And we have our ground. Okay, the first thing he showed us, he put the, the, the voltmeter to ground. And he put one wire to ground and one wire to the positive in the terminal. The difference between the ground and, and the battery positive is what? 12 volts. 12 volts, very good answer. Then he put his um, meter between the fuse there. What was that one? Wow. This said zero. We're looking at the difference in the voltage because we're on between those two points. What is it? Zero. Yeah. Then he did this. On the switch, what was that one? Zero. Zero. 12 volt. 12 volts. Okay. Why is it 12 volts? So the switch is open. So one is positive in the other one is negative. Exactly. Because here we've got 12 volts, same as here. 12 volts, there's the ground. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. 
Okay. And then he closed the switch. Oh, so he did here too. He did here. What was that one? Oh, zero. Zero. Exactly. So that was zero. But then he closed the switch. What did that go to when he closed the switch? Zero. Why is it going to zero? Because it's closed. But why? What makes a difference? Because it's just a straight line. Because, because now we've got 12 volts on both sides. Yeah. We're looking at the potential difference. The only, there would be a difference if there was a faulty switch and it had resistance, mm -hmm. a high resistance. Yes, there would be a difference. There will be a little bit of a difference because every switch will have a small amount of um, voltage drop because of the resistance in the switch, okay? But it'll be close enough to zero. But then what happened there? 12 volt. 12. 12 volts, yeah. Why? <laughs> because all the energy, all the voltage is going through, or the current, I should use the right word, not voltage, but current. The current is going through here. So this has got 12 volts, but this one goes to ground now, it's zero. It's got so I think it was, the multimeter was placed only three places, not in the fuse. Oh, well, okay. It doesn't matter anyhow, yeah, we'd have done the same thing, but yeah, it'll be zero all the time. Thank you. So but now, now if it's closed, the fuse place will also be pulled? Sorry? No. If, if, if you if, measure yeah, it, yes, the yes, 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 because there's no difference on this circuit now. This circuit, up until the resistance has 12 volts all the way through. Oh, but as soon as it goes through a load Which or a resistance, there's a voltage drop at the other end because the resistance in that load has caused the energy to be used and becomes back to the ground as a zero voltage. So as we grow in what we're doing in this unit, you'll start to understand the advantage of knowing all this for when we're doing circuit testing, okay? It will all make sense as we go on. So I'm going to keep building and building on this, all right? But I want you to really understand that. It's so important. All make sense? I'm actually going to show it to you in real life, okay? I'm going to have circuits out and we're going to show you with the voltmeter and you'll see it. Law again, okay? Here's a symbol for Ohm's Law. Often we'll see E-I-R in a circle with a cross, with, uh, or not a cross, but a T, with the E on top of the T, right? E stands for voltage, I stands for amperage, and R stands for resistance. Why they use E and I is beyond my comprehension, but for me, if I call it VAR, at least I understand voltage, amps, and resistance. What that means is, if we know the voltage, if we know the resistance, we can work out the, the amps as we did before, okay? And the symbol is, we model, if we divide A into voltage, R into voltage, we get the other one, or A multiply. Multiply, yeah. multiply right? Yeah, right. multiply, sorry, multiply. Okay. I might have said that, but multiply. You're right, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Okay, so if we had one volt, okay, one volt, we had one amp, we had one amps of resistance, or one ohms of resistance, because we, we divide one into one is one. If we multiply one by one, it's one. Okay, yeah. pretty simple, eh? Yeah. Alright. One times one, one. We don't. <laughs> okay. So we measure current, we can measure voltage and resistance. Okay, once we have two of those, we can work out the other, as I said. Again, it's just showing that Ohm's law is a is the pressure of one volt will cause one air to flow through a conductor that has one that has a resistance of one ohm. Whoa, whoa, get out. Alright. <laughs> That's alright. So, easy way to remember, just put your finger over the one you want to find. You've got your thumb, thumb, thumb over whichever one you don't have. You just start with the divide and multiply. Multiply. It's not multiply. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. We look at this, we've got a light bulb that has three ohms of resistance. You're late. We have, we have 12 volts and we have four, four ohms going through. 
Because if we divide 3 into 12, what do we get? 4. 4. What do we get? 1. Or if we didn't know the amps, that we, that we didn't know the ohms, we divide 4 into 12, what do we get? 3. If we didn't know the voltage, and we multiply 3 by 4, we get 12. Pretty easy, eh? Something I want you to really remember though, whenever we add more resistance, we have more voltage drop. That's probably the best thing to remember about Ohm's law. If we have more resistance, we have what? Voltage drop. We have more drop. voltage drop, okay? All right? <laughs> now, the guts of what he just said is Ohm's law is applicable to all the work and repairs that we do. If we know the resistance, such as in this case being a, um, a, a fuel pump, we know what the resistance of that is. We can then divide that by the voltage, which was 14 volts, and we know the amps have to be close to 6 amps. We know yes, that, don't we? Yes, sir. But we also need to um, check the voltage for voltage drops. And as he said, when he put it on the, this is the alternator here, as he put it on the case and to there, he only had 0.15 of a voltage drop. That's under 0.3 of a voltage drop, which is the limit. So it was half of the limit. So that was okay. Yeah. Then he put it on the, on the other side to here. Then he had eight, uh, 1.85 voltage drop, which is excessive. It's over 0.3 of a volt. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, he had to find out where. He went to the fuse and it was okay. Then he went to the relay. And the relay here, he had his um, voltmeter there and it was 1.8. Is that too high? Yes. It is too high. He had a faulty relay, need to be replaced. It was, it was working, but it was causing a quite a, a 1.8 of a volt faulty drop, which is excessive. So um, we don't often check relays. We know they work on and off, but do we often, um, <laughs> Do we often um, check um, check for a voltage drop? No, but we should be. Because if we put a new fuel pump in this car and we have a voltage drop of 1.8, it can't work properly because it's getting a voltage drop and it can burn out again. So it's important to check for voltage drop. Not many places do that. And we're going to do a lot of voltage drop tests in the next few days, so okay, hopefully you'll get um, a real good feel for it. All right, let's move on now. Let's move on to different circuits. There's at least three different types of circuits we can have in an in a auto-electrical se section. We can have a series circuit, we can have a parallel circuit, or we can have a series parallel circuit, the two combined, okay? The three that we can have. The most common one we'll see is mostly, we'll mostly see parallel circuits, okay? Sometimes you will see a series circuit, see, a series circuit, but, but mostly, in most cases, it will be the parallel. The problem with the series circuit, right, when we put a load in it, okay, when we put a load in like that, and it's the only load in the circuit, it's not a problem, okay? But when we start to add more loads in the same circuit, and what I mean by series is that we're running through the the actual load and coming back out the load to the next load and running back through that load before we go to our return, okay? Because we'll return the circuit. So it's going through two loads instead of one in that one circuit. And what happens is we've got two resistances in that circuit. We've got two lots of voltage drops, not one voltage drop, but two. Therefore, that bulb is not as bright as it was before because we're, we're only getting half the voltage going through that bulb because it's being shared with the other load. So you can see if we had everything wired in series, that would be a problem. Another problem would be if this light bulb decided to blow in the filament, then we've open circuited it. So the other bulb, even if it's okay, won't work. So there's a lot of reasons we don't run in series for that reason. If you have a look down here, we put three loads on there and the bulbs aren't even lighting up. And I think that's because there's too much there, there's not enough voltage for each one of them so it doesn't light up. Or it might be just a very, very slight, <laughs> slight uh, filament glow but it wouldn't be bright. So if we decide to run in parallel, meaning each um, load has its own circuit, which is 
still coming from positive and going back to negative, but they have shared, they have different circuits to individually load those. We don't have a voltage drop. Only do, we do have a voltage drop for that load, but we don't have to share, and we can have more in that circuit, okay? We can have multiple parallel circuits running at the same time, okay? And so that's why we mostly have parallel circuits. Sometimes we will share and have a parallel and a series circuit. The one I can think of is in our fan resistors, okay? Our fan resistors are, are, have got different resistors in them, and as you turn, and they're in series, and as you adjust the um, fan control, it goes through different resistors to get the, the higher or lower resistance in that circuit, okay? Um, but there would be a few others that would be in series. Uh, possibly your dimmer on your dashboard light, you know your dimmer, when you dim it and brighten it up uh, on the older, not the computer control, but the older types, uh, it would be run in series with your park lights. Um, but mostly everything's in parallel. Any questions? No. All right, keep moving forward. Okay. So, if we have a circuit like this, and we have two ohms, we have 12 volts, we know we've got six amps, don't we? Six amps flowing? Yes. So, we're looking at the total amps in this circuit. Okay? Two divided by 12 is six, so we know that. That's straightforward. But what happens if we do run something in series? We've got two different resistances. We've got a 2 ohm and a 4 ohm. What do we do? We have to add those two together, which what? equals what? Eight. 6. Eight. Then we divide that by 12, <coughs> and what two. do we get? 2. 2 amps. That's the total amps that are drawn because there's two resistances. So, does that make sense? Okay. Here, we'll complicate things. We've got one, two, three, four, four resistors in series to each other. And if we do a body shop test, it's interesting. Different types of resistances are giving us different types of voltage readings, okay? But if we look at the total, the total amp that we're drawing, okay, we have to add up all the amps. One plus four is five. Five plus five is 10. 10 plus two is 12. So 12 divided by 12 ohms of resistance divided by 12 volts equals one amp. So we have one amp going through there because of all the resistance. That's a total amp draw, okay? Is that okay? Yes. You okay? Yes. Is that basic? Is it easy to understand? Do I need to explain it more? I'm serious if you need to know more. That's all right. We're all following? Yes. Good, good. Physics, yeah. Physics. Okay. Now, this is a, a bit awkward for me to explain. And I have got an analogy, uh, uh, an analogy that I will use and it might help. But it says here the total resistance will always be less than the smallest resistor's resistors, lowest resistance leg. What we mean by leg is. You know, in a parallel circuit, I think we're talking parallel. Yes, in a parallel circuit, like before, we had we had our our light bulb. So that's the negative, positive. Um, then we had another circuit, another light bulb, <coughs> and so on. And it doesn't have to be a light bulb; it can be anything. Okay. So that is one leg of the parallel circuit. Second leg, third leg, you know, it can be more. Okay, so it's saying that if we total all the resistances, so whatever these are, maybe two ohms, maybe three ohms, whatever it is, we can add them all up and work out our total resistance. But whatever that resistance is, it will always be less than the smallest of the resistances, slowest resistance. How can that be? Okay, have I got you confused? Yes, sir. Who's not confused? <laughs> this one. Right. I don't know how to explain it other than this. If we got a bucket, right? Mm. A tin bucket or <coughs> plastic bucket and filled it with water. Mm. And we drilled a big hole and we drilled a small hole. Okay? We got a big hole and a small hole. 
Now, if we only have one hole, it would it'd be consistent with the resistance. But now we've got two holes. It's flowing quicker now because we've got two holes, even though one's smaller than the other. So the smaller hole is, or the bigger hole is the, um, the smallest resistance because it's flowing quickly, right? But it's also flowing quicker now because it's got two holes. Does that make sense? Yes. Or we could put a number of holes. If we have three legs, we have three holes. And so the water, the more holes we have, the more the, the water flows. The more the flow. That's why it's less. It's the only way I can explain it. There's more. There's all these equations on the internet. You can go and have a look, and it does your head in. But I think that's a simple way of explaining it. Okay. So, so all we need to know, we don't need to know all the equations. We just need to know the more resistances we have, that smaller resistance. Okay. It's going to flow more quicker than just that small, smaller resistance. All right. And also, the bodies drop across each parallel leg will be the same. They cut the voltage drop between each of those legs. The voltage applied to each leg is the same. So as long as the voltage is the same, and the, but the voltage drop. We're not talking about the amps now, we're talking about the voltage drop. Okay? There will be a little bit of a voltage drop on each one, and they'll all be the same. All right? The total, the total, the total will be the same. All right. Okay, the current flow through each leg will be different if the resistances are different, because some resistances will be different, okay? So, so the current, we're not talking about voltage now, we're talking about the current flow will be different. That's what changes, all right? The sum of the current in each leg equals the total current of the parallel circuit. Straightforward? Yeah. Straightforward. Straightforward. <laughs> For example, we've got two parallel circuits, okay? We have four amps, and we have four amps through those circuits, but what's the total? What's the total amperage we're using? Eight amps. Eight amps, because we have two circuits that are going to be the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. So four and four. The more we put on, the more amperage we need to run through that parallel circuit. Okay, not the voltage, but the amps have to, has to increase. Um, each leg has 12 volts supplied, 12 volt drop by each. So in other words, when the current is flowing, if we go between our load, okay, if we don't have any, um, we shouldn't have any voltage drop, it should be, okay, zero. 12 volts, sorry, 12 volts, because this side is 12, and that side goes to the ground. Yeah. Okay, there's Ohm's law again. Do I want to confuse you with that? Probably no. not. Okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Okay. So the total resistance is the sum of the resistance value of the parallel circuit. Yeah, we added those two um, circuits together, and we had eight, up, eight amps, two four amp um, parallel circuits added together, the total was eight amps. Okay, voltage drop over the parallel branch resistance is determined by the resistance value of the resistance. So depending on the how much um, resistance is in the circuit is to determine the voltage drop. Have I confused you? No. I think you're just saying that because you don't want me to keep going. <laughs> um, we're going to go over some of this when we do some practical work later, okay? Yeah. We'll go over it and it'll become more, I guess, <laughs> All right. Characteristics of series and parallel circuits. I talked about series and parallel circuits being two circuits in one, okay? Again, the total amperage of each parallel branch is determined by the resistance of the branch. The circuit amperage is determined by the resistance. Feels like I'm repeating myself, but it's, yeah. So, yeah. So, again, here we go. We have, what sort of circuit is this one? Who can tell me? What sort of circuit is the one I'm running my finger around? Series parallel. No, yeah, but forget that one for now. What is this one? Just that series. one. Series. Series, okay? So what's this one? 
series. Series. Series again, isn't it? To get a series in Yes, uh, in other words. In other words, series parallel second. I would call that almost a series. That's parallel, but it's still series. Yes. They're both a series, aren't they? So if, if we had that over here, then I'd call that a series parallel yeah. circuit. So maybe that drawing's wrong. Yeah. I didn't pick that drawing, I just, it was there for me to use, so, but yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. Okay. Ah. And no yeah. question. Oh. Yeah. Oh. No question. Because you're tomorrow, really... sir. <laughs> <laughs> Can you turn that off, please? Tomorrow's one.